HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. Heritage Radio Network is food radio supported by you. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. We've been making cheese in Wisconsin since before we were even a state, which may be one reason why we win so many awards for it. It's what happens when a whole state dreams in cheese. Find your next favorite cheese at wisconsincheese.com. Welcome to the Grape Nation, your weekly wine journey. Our guest is Justin Pisha Trungzi. Did I get that right? You got that right. It's a hard chet, right? Not chet. All right, we'll talk to Justin about Anajak. We'll talk Thai. We'll talk wine and more. Um, I asked Justin to pull a wine out to taste for the weekly wine sip. That's a favorite and something that's representative of the wine scene at this place. I'm your host, Sam Ben Ruby. Stay with us for the Grape Nation on the Heritage Radio Network. We bring wine to the people. Stacked, jacked, and whacked with every award, including a James Beard, Food and Wine's Best Chef, LA Times Best Restaurant of the Year, and a New York Times America's Best Restaurant. Justin is the second generation owner of Anajak Thai in California. More importantly, he's preserving the legacy of his family's 40-year-old restaurant, along with transforming it. After 10 years at Disney as an art director and Imagineer, working on stuff like Star Wars, Marvel, and Pixar, he left to join his family restaurant when his father became ill in 2019. Justin's innovation and love of natural wine have made Anajak one of the great food and wine destinations in America. Welcome to the Grape Nation, Justin. Oh my goodness. I can't believe I got that. <laughs> that's, a, that's a nice intro, right? That's a very nice intro. And I've, I have to say, I've been listening to the Grape Nation. I have to tell you, you know, when I was working at Disney, for all those years, the whole time, it took me a couple of years before I realized I wanted to leave and work here. And, but I just, you know, you just don't have the balls, right? You know, you, you're making, you're making, in your life. you're making big, you're making good money, the best money you've ever made out of school, um, the golden handcuffs. And what all I had was a couple of podcasts that keep me connected to the industry, but also to look outside of the restaurant to see what the hell was going on. And if I if I can sort of, you know, stroke the ego here, <laughs> I, I listened to a couple pods. I listened to your podcast, The Grape Nation, uh, Joe Campanelli's. Uh, Ooh, he doesn't do it regularly anymore, though. And that and that was like and, uh, Levy Dalton's, right. um, Leite Sue's, um, and all in the industry as well. And those these were the ones on Heritage Radio Network, especially, were the ones that like kept me connected. Um, 
and I always like I looked up to yours because you were so conversational. You were just all right. So let's get into that. All right. So we're talking to Justin at his restaurant. I am in Sherman Oaks, California. Beautiful Sherman Oaks. Beautiful Sherman Oaks on the uh, main swing, Ventura. I don't know where we are, but we're here. Um, So, Justin, I mentioned to you off air that really the story here is the story, and that's the story of Anajak. Um, So what I want to start with is I want to start with a little family history about Anajak and your journey in life and wine that is so interwoven into Anajak. Um, So where do we start? I give you the I mean, were you a kid that sat in a corner table during the day doing your homework? It's a table corner table that doesn't exist, which is right now where we keep a lot of our wines. That used to be table 12. I would do all my homework there. Okay. So you were a a restaurant kid. kid. I was a restaurant kid. Spent more time here than I did at home. And my father started in 81. And um, and he cooked here for, I mean, we're, we've been around for a long time. He was doing that station as the chef and as the owner, as the buyer of all the things, as his own bookkeeper for like 38 years before I started. And with my mom in the front and him on the walks. And it was a small neighborhood, little Thai spot. That Why Sherman Oaks? Actually, you know, you I, living I, around I here. Or? Asked, no? Uh, no, we live, we live in Reseda, which is like a couple miles away. Okay. It's not that bad. Um, but I think he was kind of already thinking of a kind of a blue ocean strategy. He was like, all the Thai restaurants are over there. There's no Thai restaurants over here. And he was one of the first, if not one of the first two in the valley. Um, and Were there a lot anyway or not even a lot of Thai? I mean, no, they were really I, think there sprinkled? Was only, I think there was only one or two others. Uh, we were the only one on the strip that, uh, so it's probably us, Talesai, Lana, Ty, and one other. Anybody still around? Some people are. Yeah. Talesai, I believe, is still around. Lana, Ty closed after 38 years. Do you feel your dad had a hand in, you know, making Ty more approachable, available, uh, other people in the Thai community thought, hey, he's doing it, we can, or it was just... It's, I mean, I think it's a combination of he's a very good cook. and So the food spoke for... The, yeah, he's a very good cook, and he's, a, he's the loveliest, kindest man. So it's like good, really nice hospitality. Um, and I think people thought it, Thai food, was, they like didn't know what it was. It's like, oh, this is like spicy Chinese food. Like, right. what is this? You know, and right. my dad is ethnically Chinese born in Thailand, but, um, but it wasn't known as what it was in the eighties. You know what, when he was cooking and serving Thai, cause Thai is so sophisticated now, you know, regionally. And was it just general Thai? It's such a dumb question, but I'm curious. Oh, yeah. No, everyone was like, oh, is it a regional thing? And I was like, regionality in Thai food really wasn't a thing here. Right. You know, just like I mean, dad was born in Bangkok, ethnically raised Chinese. My mom's born in the South, but they didn't have Southern. We didn't think about Southern Thai heritage or Northern or regional Thai heritage until only recently. Right. You know. Which, which you kind of see more of it. Now, it's funny. We were talking. You were in the corner doing your homework when you were a little kid. At some point, don't you start wandering around the kitchen or your dad says, hey, come here. Let me show you how to make this. Oh, totally. I mean, when yeah. does that start? And I guess it never stopped. And it was like mainly during the lunch hour when it was quiet and on the weekends, um, I just rummage around the fridges, try to make salads for myself and like <laughs> go get like a hard boiled egg and mix it with this <laughs> sauce. And like, and then the thing is they would just hand me drinks to serve to tables. They'd say, go, go to table four, tell them who you are. 
and uh, introduce What was yourself. the tell? Um, um, my dad owns this place? or um... I was like, it's exactly the question that I asked him. I was like, <laughs> wait, what do you want me to say? And they're like, just be yourself. And I think that's why I was born in the front of house first. Um, and actually that's a, a you know, I, I say as like one foot in the front of the house and one foot in the back of the house, but really, uh, you know, as a, as a kid, they're all, they're going to make you be a server before they're going to make you cook. Right. Um, but it's good to have knowledge of everything. Um, there's a time where you're doing that and there's a time where you get older into your teens. And I guess, you know, you finish high school, college, go to design school. What, talk to me about that time when, hey, listen, you know, my dad's in here six, seven days a week working 12 hours. I'm out of here. I'm going to college because this is what I like. I'm good at it. And then I, you take a job. Yeah. Was that smooth or did you have the support of your parents, which I would think you would? No, I did. My parents are very, I mean, I think they, as all immigrant parents, are trying to end intergenerational pain right. they're trying to end the immigrant story that's a because good... the immigrant story was not a quote-unquote marketing tool for them you know it was they that was who they were they my dad came here when he was 18 years old and he just wanted to be an american like everyone else and if you think if i think about it i'm like he's more american than most of the people i know because he like made that dream happen as so many of us did I, I agree. And um, and so I, I look up to that kind of like independence. Um, uh, and but I, tell me about I was in a at the time that you were in school and then you took a job. Was there any discussion or pressure think, no, of like, you know, no. Justin, we need you here. Or you're going to do this or you're not. I mean, was there any? Is there ever any discussion? It's always a kind of a uh, a, a kind of a, per, a filial guilt, if you will. Um, like, hey, true that, yeah, you know, like, hey, yeah. it's it's Christmas Eve, you gotta come work, you know. And I was that I I was working the holidays and the weekends, and I was coming here at work after Disney, um, pretty regularly. It, oh yeah. Like you I, had I, this I, legit job I, and then you'd run out of there instead of meeting buddies at a bar, you would come here and help with the service. Yeah, no, it, it, and, and so I was at first, it was kind of like, ah, oh, shit, like I got to go help mom and dad out. And without and any became, real resentment, right? I mean, no, minor. I think, it, I think it, you know, when you're a kid, sure, you're just like, ah, I got to do. But then eventually I realized how much I loved it and. And how I was like kind of, I, I was kind of good at it, you know? And I felt, I felt that I could feel things in the dining room that activated who I was. You right. know, I, you could, I could stand there at the pass and I knew intuitively where every table was at in their course. So you, you had a hospitality mind and you didn't mind doing hospitality, which is not an easy thing. Obviously, if all those things were clicking, right? It, 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 there's a kind of a sensitivity that you got to have in hospitality. You're kind of like a little bit more sensitive to people's feelings. And that's why you end up working in this field because you're like... Is that restraint too? Like if a guy's kind of a dick, yeah. you kind of got to understand he's the customer paying, so you restrain... Back then, they were very rest restraining. Um, and now we're a little bit like, hey, look, guys, this is who we are. Like, music's loud. I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. If food's like this, I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. Wine's like this. And yeah, I know it's like weird, but here we are. So Just that, that's an interesting point because there's a transition going on. And I'm sure there are not tons, but a lot of regular customers that may have been old school. Did you look at them during the transition and say, okay, they get it. They're not getting it. They're not. I mean, what, that was a risk, not a risk. Yeah. That was a choice you made. Here's where I want to go. You know, some people accept it. Some won't. How'd that work there's, with the older customers? Not age. No, just, there's, there's a lot of people think that I 
don't like older customers because they complain about stuff. But here's the thing. Many of our older customers, they're coming in, they're having a blast, they're buying a lot of wine, they're dancing in the dining room, they're celebrating their birthdays here. And they were coming here when they were a little younger and like they're having a grand old time. I, I, and then some people, they're like, yeah, we just can't figure out how to use Resi. Um, right. And I'm like, I, I know, like I can, I should do a tutorial for Resi. Well, how do you do it on um, a flip phone, right? I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. And it's hard because look, how many restaurants in New York, they don't answer their phone once service begins. Listen, that whole model has changed with Resi, even open table exclusivity i mean it's it's kind of a, a month in advance at a certain time i mean the reservation thing is you know kind well, there's of there's always going to be more people that want to dine in restaurants than there are restaurants to serve yes. everyone yes in general regardless of if the place is good i right, finish um the last chapter of this part of the discussion and that is you spend and correct me if i'm wrong a good 10 years at disney yeah. And the way it sounds, you know, a nice ascension to jobs, responsibilities, titles and all that worked on some good stuff. Um, and you said you never untethered yourself from the restaurant. You were always involved with working whenever. All right. So that's a little of the background. Um, let's get to fairly current, which is really where the story takes some interesting turns. Um, Fair to say 2019 was a year that changed your uh, life. Your dad fell ill. My dad had a stroke and he Who had... was a rock and then now he's down, right? Yeah. 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 And I, I, I know exactly where I was and everything when it was all going down. And I think he didn't even realize he was having a stroke when he had a stroke. He, um, he was here and he was um, getting tired and he went home and like it's very strange for him to do that so i had basically left work in order to come and see what was going on um and it turns out that that was the beginning of the end of that chapter for him and him being forced into his retirement um so take a minute there he has a stroke he's here his whole life he goes down on that goes home because he's and from that point on did he come into work at all or try to or the stroke was debilitating enough where yeah he i mean he, it was harder for him to walk he had to do a lot of therapy in order right. to get back on his feet um he's still in a wheelchair but i mean the discussion was gonna it was beginning then uh in my mind like was i gonna leave and so did, once you understood yeah. Which is the point you're saying that he's probably not going to return to the restaurant at any capacity that he did. What goes through your mind and what do you think you have to do? Is that, is well, that no, the I, defining? I, I immediately start. I imme the next day I went to the markets. Because who else would him. do it? The next day I set up service. The next day you know, we were, I was doing everything that dad was doing. It, and, and so it was, and my. But dis- silly question. Was that a work day? And you called in and said, I got to take all, you know, my dad's. Yeah. Um, and, and my Disney bosses were nice. They, they, I mean, they kept me on payroll for a little bit of time and they kind of knew what was happening. They knew how much I love this place. We had done many, you know, outings Stuff, here. Right, right. So they kind of knew how much I enjoyed it. And my boss had asked me many times, he was like, so what are you going to do like about the restaurant one of these days? And he was smart. He kind of knew. Um, so uh, my mom, she says to me, she's like, I, I know you don't want to think about it this way, but you, this happening is kind of like the universe giving you a little bit of an in to doing what you always said you wanted to do, which is come here and take over. And you've been saying that for a while, and you've been doing some great things. By that time, I was already buying a bunch of wine for the place. We are already growing the list. At that time, we were already changing. I was already making moves to the menu or I was cooking in the back. And I was like, you know what? 
like maybe maybe she's right. Maybe it's kind of like a kind of a cosmic. So your mom was an instigator in a good way, like. She's Here's an instigator the, in good and bad ways. Well, all mine. <laughs> but cosmic opening, you know, like yes. you, you could do, that was a good thing. Never talking about selling, right? Like maybe uh, never mm, in the cards? I mean, I think they threaten it to me. <laughs> They're like, they well, did. if you're not going to, you know, do this, then we did, might as well. Did you think for a moment that this would be temporary? I got to get to the market the next day or the produce and the meat won't be there. I got to get this thing kind of leveled out and straight. Then I could decide what I want to do. Or did you make your mind up? Uh, no, there was no strategy okay. uh, at all. And I, and I actually kind of like appreciate a no strategy approach sometimes, you know, I think we, we gen in general strategize ourselves too much. And with this place, I mean, the magic w is in the improvisation that we do. And that happens throughout all aspects of how we run the restaurant. You just got to kind of succumb to it. I think that's what makes it special. All right. So that's a pretty life-changing thing in a lot of ways. You know, your dad, your dad's health. Um, you know, you have to think about him. The restaurant was so dependent upon him. Um, big deal. But life doesn't end there because not much later, the friggin' pandemic hits which may have been one of the toughest episodes for a specific industry, restaurants and hospitality, right? Which, which in the end, actually, when we think about it, was a good way for me to learn how to run the restaurant without it being busy. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's, it's like, like a training. soft opening like a, or opening in the summer. You know, so, you get a little space. Yeah. You get a little space, you get, get a little time to talk shit with people, think about stuff. I mean, how many times do you get to have a break like that? You, you, I mean, hopefully never again, but no. Oh, yeah. but I'm curious, Correct. at that point, which really wasn't much later than when your dad got sick and you jumped in, and you talked about it a little, in your mind, were you settled or had the beginning of the ideas of where you wanted to go or you were at where you wanted to be or the pandemic kind of really created a pause and okay I've made the moves from my dad the pandemic gave me a little space did a lot of the ideas come up during that pandemic time or these things were floating around your head before during I, I think one thing that I realize is that when I, I realize that depression fuels your creativity and boredom fuels your creativity. And if you have a time, you're in a time in your life where you're feeling, you know, big swells of emotion. Um, you can channel those things into something kind of useful if you just kind of open yourself to them. And uh, I was going through a lot at that time, but the restaurant kind of needed a little healing period. And that's when we just started to say, like, let's try little things. And, and all these like little micro projects and ideas kind of birthed. Well, let, let's talk about some of those. Um, some... You may explain her micro. Some seem a little more macro. Um, you know, nobody was sitting inside during COVID. So Which is why we, when we started to put out the wine, because people were ordering takeout and picking takeout uh, right. in here. So I was Give like, them a wine option. Let's just show them the wine. We'll list it out. We'll write little notes. And then they can pick it up on the way. You know, and they, in New York, they had to go through a whole legislation thing for a yeah. restaurant to be able to walk in and walk out with wine. And they realized it would only help the restaurant tours. So they did it, but, you know, not quick enough. Um, so yeah. Taco Tuesday, that's more of a macro than a micro. You said, listen. It grew, no, it grew out of it grew out of me just wanting to do a family meal for these guys and the cooks. um, just kind of using family meals as a creative outlet, as it is for many restaurants. Right. Um, and I was like, I'm a, I'm gonna do tacos, you know. And so I, 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 and I think it's kind of like now it's this big party, it's a big thing, and but it, it grew out of just kind of a simple thing, like, 
you know, can we do this? Can we do the service in the alley? This is what we're given. Um, can we try to cook something that's out of the vernacular of who we think we are and who, who you think you are, uh, doesn't have to be who you will be for the rest of your life. Right. And so the beauty of, the beauty of, uh, Anna Jack is that it's kind of a little bit bigger than the four walls, uh, and the alley even, it's just like, you got to look outside yourself sometimes. And that's what allowed us to kind of break the shell, if you will. So it's interesting because, I mean, I'd be happy going to a restaurant that just serve family meals you know i mean that would be a cool thing bring in guest you know workers yeah that would be cool so the taco thing came out of that and it's stuck to this day where it's you know i mean it's it's one of your wheelhouses in a way um how do you get to a japanese omakase just more curiosity and expansion and let me actually that was that was an interesting move because we were only serving one table a night during the pandemic in the alley and it was it was of Japanese omakase. Well, just of, omakase. of our menu, right? Our, just the regular menu, and it was a four person minimum, and it was a two bottle minimum, and we only did two. T- we did one table, two turns. Did you one ever table, not sell them out? No, we had them. We had them out all the time, right? And so it was just bookable through my DMs, and back then that was manageable. <laughs> And our my industry friends were like, hey, look, like, why don't you just cook us whatever you want to cook us? I was like, okay. And they're like, why don't you do something like, like, just course it out and, like, try out some new things on us? Like, So maybe my confusion, was it the idea of omakase or was it Japanese food? It was. No, no, no. It was just the idea of, like, a, kind of a, a, tr- Your a trust, choice. A trust, yeah, a yeah, trust yeah. me style. I thought maybe you were really trying to dig into, you know, Japanese cuisine. I mean, I'm sure there's some in there. You no, know, there is. I mean, there's there's techniques from all over. But my, my I mean, my father was a sushi chef for, like, 12 years before he, was? he started this. Yeah. Oh, so he had his chops so, down. He had his chops down. He knew really how to work good. with fish. And, like, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that he did because it kind of rubbed off on us. Um yeah, that's a good thing. What about, we also talked about it earlier, you know, your dad had his menu and he was great at making everything. Um, do you eventually, during the time we're talking about, do you get into these regional specialties? Are there dishes that were worth the fight with him? Like, dad, how come we're not making this? And you just say, screw that. We won't make it. You were able to, you know, expand your wings a little in that sense. Yeah, yeah. Basically, got to. I mean, the the entry point for me in the menu is really about the sourcing. And talk to sor- me about that. Yeah, he I mean, always had. Like I, I read a story. Your mom, and we'll talk about it, is famous for her dessert, sticky rice and mango. But it had to be a certain mango. Right? Yeah, yeah, you just can't go out and buy a box of mangoes. <laughs> Which yeah. is what you're alluding to, you right? Gotta, yeah, I, I mean, there was not much, um, there was not much like finickiness in terms of the sourcing and the buying until I came along. Uh, with, when with, with regards to fish and chicken and produce, I started shopping at but the where, farmers what, market. But what's the finicky? Is it organic? Is it better purveyors? I know you found a, a dried fish guy which maybe your dad that was, was that you know was, is that the type of stuff that the was finicky? the that was the start was the start to the story of the new menu was really around fish and seafood and coupled with the San Monica farmers market and all the amazing farmers there because I I was like man I want to shop where you know all these amazing people shop like seasonal uh, great farmers and right I didn't, in front of your eyes. I didn't know anything about the seasons back then. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't understand. I mean, California, it's harder to understand, right. but I didn't, um, I didn't know who was going to be good and who wasn't going to be good. I just started trying and I just started going every week, twice a week. It was a good time. Like a kind of a fun place. to like just learn and did, walk around. Did, the purveyors, the farmers, and what was available start influencing what and how you were doing? I mean, obviously, right? Oh, yeah, totally. I mean, those some of those farmers are, like, good friends, you know, now. Um, 
and we get to we get to we get to include that stuff that I feel most most Thai restaurants aren't going out of the cuisines, you know, vernacular because it's like, well, I mean, why would we use plums and papaya salad? But we're like, let's use plums. I mean, it's like it's close enough to a tomato and plums are in season. And tomatoes aren't in season. So let's use, you know, it's you do whatever you want and it's yeah. delicious. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's the beauty of, you know, all that produce in front of you. Um, so as far as the menu, the offerings are similar do you delete stuff do you add stuff like you said the papaya salad really never had plums now why not i mean is there a lot of that going on there's quite a bit of it going on we see most of the menu changes happen in the uh omakase which is every month the last weekend of every month and it's four days it's thursday friday saturday sunday and it's you know, it's like somewhere between 19 to 20 plates of food. And there's there's a time for us to kind of experiment. We're publishing our R&D, you know. Um, now it's starting to get a little bit more uh, rigid in its structure. But before it was that, super loose. We were, is that not where you want to get to or that's okay to No, get that's to okay. It? okay. That's okay. Because before it was just me and Chef Ian over there cooking outside for six people but right. now we do it for the whole dining room and all the cooks get to learn all the psalms and, and not hard to pull to off to bring it to everyone inside and all that they all, is it harder than a normal service yeah it is yeah it's harder than a normal just because of more coursing and smaller and a lot more ingredients we get to be a little bit a little bit uh more precise Okay. A la carte That's service. fun. You're going to do the a la carte service tonight. It's it's okay. just it's family style. It's I, I love that. Yeah. Um, Bring your Roberta shirt. I got it now. Bushwick. Um, before we take a break, and we have to take a break, um, and when we come back from the break, I want to talk to you about wine, wine and food. But two things: we got to figure out how to open this wine so we could taste it and talk about it a little later. But I'm curious on the food part. The minute the responsibility fell to you, and even today, everything that led up to you starting to cook and pretty much run the kitchen, were you ready? Were you 90% ready? Were you 70 and you self-taught the other 20? You sat with your old man and said, listen, I'm struggling with this. Or that. I mean, where were you? Because now that doesn't seem like, you know, the problem with innovation, ingredients, how you shop. Uh, 0% ready. Um, okay. Exactly. Not zero. Because all the summers zero. in the kitchen. you're. It, it's true. It's true. It's true. Um about 1% ready. Okay. Uh, Thank you for clarifying that. <laughs> no, running a kitchen is um, not as much about cooking as it is about the management of very creative, very hardworking people. So you, um, what, I, what I was more prepared to do was be able to create a structure. And that, and that didn't come about until much later. The cook's... And I had to learn how to interpret my father's recipes and techniques and things that we saw him do that we never learned from him directly. So we had to kind of learn as a trial by fire, you know. You, you know, the, maybe you've seen it, maybe not. The bear, yeah. you know, where everyone's stuck in their old ways and their old that, recipes. I mean, Where you have to come in and say, man, this is the way we have to do it. And this is... You know, we're using these radishes, not, you know, I mean, was that like a thing you had to go through? The bear is a true mirror. Um, it is. Uh, I mean, to, to our story, exactly, you know, and I'm, I have my cousin in the story. Cousin, maybe mom. Yeah, she plays that role. Um, auntie is probably my Tina. Um, it's all there. I mean, yeah. The, the setup is very similar. All that, I, it's not aggravation. It's not nonsense. But all that noise is kind of built in. And you got to um, deal with it and move forward, right? We have we have a lot of the same, you know, character archetypes here. Um, 
really cerebrally minded cooks, really um, more visceral, tactile, sensitive, front of house people we have we it's a combination of different types of thinkers and that's what i love that's what my father didn't have my father had he had he had people that he could yell at and that was that worked back that, then. that's old school. That's i old mean when school. i started working i got yelled at later on you just didn't do that but that's just not yeah. how it, things are a done workplace is. yeah the kitchen is just a workplace right it just looks a little different so <laughs> like the bear it seems like everything kind of evened out and got better and things were going well, you know, with some bumps. Are you at that place now? Yeah, the challenges, you know, it's like we look forward to different challenges every year. And the challenge this year is about building a structural foundation. You know, last year the pyramid was really flipped upside down and I felt like many decisions were really just coming to, to me. And now I'm, I'm happy to give away a little bit of responsibilities. That's a good manager. That's a good owner. Good person delegates because I'm stressed. <laughs> well, you're stressed because you didn't figure out how to delegate early enough. Now you yeah. understand that. Trust me on that. All right, Justin, we have to take a break. When we come back, I want to talk to you about the wine, which I think is a impressive big deal here, along with the food, which is the same. So we're talking to Justin um, from Anajak Thai. When we come back, um, like I said, we're going to taste some wine and uh, talk about what probably fills up half of this restaurant. There's wine everywhere. Um, you're listening to The Grape Nation on the Heritage Radio Network. We'll be right back. This episode is brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. There's a reason when you think of Wisconsin, you think cheese. Cheese is a huge part of Wisconsin's history and future. In Wisconsin, the state of cheese, the tradition of cheesemaking excellence began 180 years ago before Wisconsin was recognized as a state. Immigrants traveled to settle in this lush, green hills of Wisconsin, bringing their cheesemaking traditions with them. These storied skills combined with the freshest milk available created a cheesemaking culture that is uniquely Wisconsin. Wisconsin's 1,200 cheesemakers, many of whom are third and fourth generation, continue to pass on old world traditions while adopting modern innovations in cheese making craftsmanship. Find your next favorite cheese at wisconsincheese.com. All right, we're back. We're back with my uh, guest, Justin Pichet Rongzi um, from Anajak Thai. All right, so let's talk about wine. All right. I'm curious. I need you to help me with this because this setup is impressive. All right. When you weren't here, um, I was, you know, pulling bottles out of the car, you know, opening doors, looking at empty bottles. There's like a whole wall of Keller over there. Which is always, <laughs> the so, Keller wall is my favorite. Always a nice touch, you know, a <laughs> Keller wall and all that. So here's what I need you to tell me. When did you... And I don't know if I could craft the question exactly right. When did you realize you were into natural wines? You know, when was that transition? You know, was there an influencer there, a person? Was there a thing, a store? I mean, did you go into a restaurant and they were doing this then? And you're like, well, I kind of get it. And that's, you know, what's, what's that natural wine wall you cross through? Yeah, it wasn't even necessarily specific to natural. It was just wine in general. You know, I went so to... So first you start with wine. Like and wine is an intriguing liquid to you. It's such an intriguing no, liquid. No, big time. I mean, I was just thinking about... I was thinking about how I got it. Everyone's like, how did you get into wine? I'm like, I just drank wine, uh, you know? And and even, but even you drinking... you weren't drinking wine the way you're talking about now. Is that... After work, going out with people, was there a guy that like, hey, try this? No, no joke. I'm telling you. Okay. From, from when I'm sitting there in the office, the third floor 
of the Grand Central Creative Campus at Disney. And in my ear is your podcast and Joe Campanelli's podcast. Yeah. And I was listening to Eric Asimov's book. I was reading his articles. I was reading John Bonet's book, New California Wine. Right. I was reading books. Was I was here. reading. So, so it was kind the, of a gravitation towards something, self-interest, which leads to self-teaching. Like, let me read this book. Was, let me. I was starting to really enjoy a lot of the characters that I was meeting around wine. Um, Elliot Wang of uh, Everson Royce was someone who was studying at the time. And Is I never took That's a retail tests. store? Yes. Royce? Yeah, in, in Pasadena. De- okay. I was going to school out in the art center, and I was living out in Pasadena. And I was like, let's go Would you just store. wander in just and walk around? In, yeah. Talk to him? Oh, yeah. Okay. So you cleared something up for me. There was this intrigue, intrigue with wine, um, wine in general. A uh, little self-taught. Does this thing move towards more thoughtful producers or natural stuff? Is I that? Think, I think it was. I think it was in. In you know. I mean, that's what you were starting to see. Because it's hard I not mean, to ask these questions when you look at you know what but the vibe every, is here, and we'll talk about. It. I, I want to talk. It's about not. A, it's not. I, I mean, our list is not a dogmatically natural we're, list. We're right going to talk. We're going to talk about. All right. Um, <laughs> So was there a point at wine, with wine that I'll never know what the hell's going on. It's so detailed me or not me, you, or that, listen, I'm learning little by little. I'm interested. I'll stay patient with it. You know, let me keep tasting and reading. Was that what it was or wasn't that thought? I, I know I wanted to, I mean, I was in school for so long. I wanted to like learn something about the restaurant that I could contribute to. And the wine world provided a lot of things. It provided the ability. I was like looking at, you know, you're looking at these Bibles that you'll, you, you felt like the knowledge was just so expansive. You, it, it, nothing seemed, you could never finish the knowledge, you know? I mean, I think like a, a, a sommelier, master sommelier is like as hard as a, like, de- you know, dental school or something. It it's is. It's crazy, it, the it, depth it, of knowledge. It, the depth of knowledge is so deep. Um, and I wanted, my parents had Kendall Jackson. Well, let's, you you, the, you had like the, four wines on the list. Yeah. Your, that if was your dad. Did. Wine was such a tertiary thing, right? So you had four wines. So White Zinfandel was on the list. I love that. Um, <laughs> chilled. Six bucks. Chilled. With ice. Um all right, so no real, you know, Peter Luger in New York, you know, considered the greatest steakhouse, has no wine on their list. It's crazy what they don't have. You know, here it's crazy how good the food was. And Kendall Jackson was a recognizable name. When does the movement towards thoughtful wine start coming in here? Is that before your dad gets sick? Is that after? It was Is before. the pandemic? It was before. I was. You were, you I were was, saying to your dad, we need to up the wine game. So, Elliot and Joe at Everson Roy said, you know, you should talk to talk to Robert from Farm Wine. And Ro- Farm is the distributor for Louis Dresner. Okay. And so I was like, okay. And they're like, okay, and we'll t- tell you how to price everything. And we'll- Did they say that because they knew the guy and they knew Dresner's list? You know, yeah. if you pick any yeah. imported distributor is good enough. And I'll, so start with that. And I'll tell you this. It's all about personalities in the space. But I met Robert and I was like, wow, Robert's a nice guy. He just knows a lot. It's not pretentious. And wine was like pretty daunting. But he was like, you know, we're opening up a couple of bottles. We taste it. And I was like, I remember the six wines that he recommended. And we put all six wines on the list. I was going to ask you, do you remember? So Robert was a true good influence early on, right? Robert Brownson is the first wine influencer for me. And in L.A., everyone knows him. His palate kind of matched what you were either curious about or liked both. It was sophisticated enough for me to feel like, you know, I wanted to hang out with him a little bit more. Um, (laughs) 
and we put all those wines on you the list. you remember some of them? Oh, yeah. Um, Let me hear. I mean, that's fun to know what it was then. So, Bengoitsha Chocolina. <laughs> okay. Chocolina. Chocolina. Nobody knows how to spell it. Go ahead. There's a Z and an X and a W right. in it. Um, we had Francois Pinon Vouvray. Uh, we, I believe we had the Trois Gilles Cuvée. Very good. Um, we had Foradori. The Foradori Foradori. Chirol de Go. Um, there was no Chardonnay on it. I had... Well, you had Vouvray, you had Shannon, you know, those things. And then we had... We, there was a Cab Franc. From the Loire? On, from the Loire. Um, I have to remember who it was. But a- anyways, it was... We we still carry these wines from time... Oh, we had uh, Agnes and Rene Moss, um, Shannon. We had the Rouge Affair. They still um, make great wines. So still make great wines. Is this the wines that were on the list and then you throw these six on? Were there other wines around then? No. So that was really that was the the wines and the foray into, you know, curating the right wines. What happens? You continue to eyeball what wines you <laughs> add wines <laughs> yeah. and you're basically Robert and what tastes I good. Had to, and I had to build... I mean, I, I we we started buying more. I was like, "Whoa, shit!" Like, we have to buy six more cases. We just that was their it. requirement. We just bought. We just. Bought, oh, you mean it was moving? Yeah, yeah. I was oh, like, good, we good, good. Just good. bought six cases about seven days ago. My mom was like, "It's too much money." I was like, "Mom, but look at <laughs> look, look at look at the money you're making." She goes, "They don't look." So at we that. were just we were taking the profits from that and we were buying more inventory. And then I expanded to Amy Atwood's book and then we expanded to the revel book and then we expanded. And then I, I was like, Oh, I've been, I've been hearing about these producers. Let's get more. Um, and we eventually had a list, I think pre pandemic, it was about 130 SKUs. Then the pandemic hit, we sold all the inventory through the, couple, the few years right and then we started almost from zero with um, the opportunity to make changes with add the stuff or or yeah. same base but spread it out a little with the opportunity to include the regions that i always want to include which was um champagne mosul and white and red burgundy um and so i was I'm good like, with that and um, so there, and it began. So the representation of that before what you're talking about was lighter on the list. If very light. Yeah. Okay. And, and why that? I mean, you're out there drinking more of it. Um, yeah. It tastes better. I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know, if you, if you go to a restaurant in New York and you hang around after lunch service, you'll see three guys walk into the bar with wine cases, wine sales guys. Of course. Do you did you get that? I mean, were wine people, good or bad product, were able to inspire you by saying, "Hey, you got to try this." You got yeah. Is it as busy, you know, here, you know, with all of that? Um, we now we do our tastings combination on Tuesday and sometimes um, at yeah, Ian's it gets house too or crazy. Director's house. Um, John Cherusulo, he's he was our very first psalm ever. Came from New so York. So you eventually took on some help. John is because the first guy. When was that? That was right when we opened doors after the pandemic. Okay. And he was like, Oh, you want those regions? I'll tell you how to get them. I know all of them. See, where do you, he was, where he was do you working. come to John? How does that relate? He was dining here. He had just moved just, from New York. He was working in New York. He was working with Von Bowden, Stephen. With Stephen, who wrote and, a book, by the way. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's coming um, out. I can't wait. Uh, and John was, he's an artist. He's an artist like me. And a wine guy. And a wine guy. And he was working with Stephen. He was like, let's bring in this. He knew all the books. He knew who, all the people from the Who books. approaches it? Does he say, hey, man, let me help you do this? Or do you say, you're into this like me. Can you help me? How does that I'm just curious like, the he, dynamic. I mean, he was he was making money as an artist, so he was kind of doing this for fun. Oh, and he used, I saw him slip into the role. 
just opening bottles, moving around, being a great host, bringing in people, introducing us to some great, great wine guests. And then I saw the, you know, I, we both saw the power of like where the list was going. Um, and it was starting to shift from what was stylistically natural to something very broad and like region and, and sort of traditionally oriented, classically oriented. And I was like, the list is becoming a mirror of the menu in a way that it's like a combination of contemporary and classic. And that to me is the beginning of the, our identity within, within wine. John Cherisulo gave us so many of the tools. He was essentially our very first wine director. Um, and then we started hiring more Psalms. So how do you define traditional and contemporary? I mean, I, 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 like for three years I've been <laughs> wrestling with, and it's the dumbest question, how I natural wine is defined. And I don't give a crap anymore. I don't um, know. But is traditional, like, aren't, I don't want to use the word force, but aren't you forced to have some traditional wines because that's the ask of the clientele? Or even before they ask, you think they should be on the list? I, 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 I don't know if we were so conscious about it. Again, we're just trying not to be super conscious about it. And we, I think we're just chasing what we felt was going well in this. It's not only with the food. Was that only, more inward than outward? Like this way, is, this yeah. is what we feel it's, is good yeah. with the, this yeah. is what we like. Yeah. Because, you know, we, yeah, because, because we're noticing certain things just poured better in the space. The space is really smoky. Certain things just work better with the, I'm, and, and look, I have to pay respects to the people that have done great wine lists in Thai restaurants before us, you know, first Lotus of Siam, second night market, um, you know, and you have very, very unique perspectives to go with Thai food, but Thai food is as broad as it gets in terms of like palate. There is as many regions and subregions as you can find in in um, in France for right. wine. Right. So with that, we were just like, you look, can we explore the tradition as we have explored traditional cuisine here? It's, you know, you serve a piece of fish. It's not always about the fish. It's about the sauce well, and, you sure. know, the, the pairing and all that, you know, I have a thing called the wine list and I ask all my guests favorite wine and food pairing. But with you, I get weary about um, talking about food and wine pairing. You know, the, you talk to the wine guy at Roberta's and you say, hey, what pairs with pizza? You know, I sit here with that. What pairs with Thai? I, I get weary about that. But the food influences the wines. No way around that, right? I mean, I mean you just can't at, be random and you, say, I like this. You're and, looking at, you know, the it's a terroir. I believe I probably heard on your shows, terroir is the union of the land and the people. Um, yeah, and for, people is the part people forget. People is an important part. And it's just like, there's just something that needs to be poured in a space like this. And, you know. So to me, a place like this, the food has always been the thing, but it seems like the wine really rounds out the experience. It's, it's as thoughtful as the food. Um, do you agree? I mean, this place is really what you want it to be because now the addition of wine and the type of wines. Fair to say that? I, there's, I, am, there's, I am the most upset when I go to restaurants outside of this one. When I see wine lists that feel like they they don't have as much conviction or perspective, trying to check boxes, yeah, like here's or, some orange and or they're all champagne's just, hot. Here's a couple more than normal. I just feel like there's a there's there's it like drinking at a restaurant is so enjoyable and so much more enjoyable than drinking wine at home sometimes. Oh, that yeah. Like, right? Well, it's that, an that occasion like, to go out. You get like, excited. If, if, if the wine is bad, then 
bad food, bad service, bad wine, any combination it's, or singularly yeah. will ruin it. My wife will say to me, what do you think? I go, how does that guy pick that wine? It sucked. That's all I'll be talking about. I love that. Not that that was the greatest prawn dish I ever ate. That's or, so funny. You know, or the service sucked. Or what. I mean, those three things are important to me. What are uh, we? What, you want to open this? So let yeah, it let, of, let's open that. Are we going to um, ASMR open it a little yeah, bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have plenty. To, we have a lot of things to do still. Um, in your mind, <laughs> is there any criteria for the wines that you want? Like, you know, you, you, you basically disclaim the fact, listen, I'm not a natural wine restaurant. Those wines are important to me. But I balance but is there criteria you know is it smaller family owned thoughtful you know what, what or it's, even that doesn't play into it no i uh, i mean my wine director ian is ian took over from john ian, ian krupp from, yes okay ian took over from john and ian built uh a, you know built the bones really we had a you know we we went from a kind of abstract expressionism to now, you know, you know, now it's like rom- romanticism. And, okay. <laughs> and so we've, we've gone into the realm of finding wines and, and typically speaking, you know, most of the wines are going to be sustainably organic or, or biodynamic. Um, I mean, of course our preferences for, you know, native yeasts, um, right. But really, it's like, does it taste good? You know, that's the final, you know, check. Because in doing the show for over seven years and seeing the natural, you know, wine scene progress, the wines went anywhere from crappy and inconsistent to some of the most sought after wines, you know, ever. So there's been an evolution of that, too. Uh, let's talk about the wine list for a second. Yes. So what's crazy about your wine list is that it's it's packed. It's well thought out. We've been talking about it for 20 minutes. But what's crazy is I think it's like three, four point type. You're like it's, yeah. <clears throat> old guys like me are like squinting in it. You know, is so that, that is that Shinon or Chinese food? Like I can't, you know. Technically what, it's six point. It's six point. And it go, it's it's one eleven by seventeen print on both sides, but with a cover. Okay. Um, it's pretty. But it's it looks like it's just gray. Yeah. Uh, because it, there's so much text, it's just noise, it's, really. It's so let's let's talk about you know what's how many selections. I think we're about three eighty five. Okay. Like that right now. And let's talk how that breaks Listed. down. And I know things are fluid. You know, this isn't. Um, do you lean towards a region because of the food, because of your liking, because of both? I mean, what's, what's well, the, the, the conceptions that, uh, Thai food's got to go with Riesling. Right. Um, Gewürz, I mean, Tremony. we are, actually, we don't have much Gewürz no. at all, but we have one. Um, we have a lot of Riesling. We have some of the greatest Riesling producers, that I can name, but what is really the the stars is going to be white burgundy and red burgundy. It's Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, and I think we have it's so deep. But um, French wine, I don't know. It just gets me going. Okay, I mean, so <laughs> there's definitely a lean towards French. You named a bunch. How often do you have to uh, print that wine list? Oh, uh, we print once a week. Oh, you do? We print once a week. Wow. Um, changes, which obviously. Yes, 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 yes. So you have the format. You just go and pull stuff off, pull stuff in. Um, do you think, as far as lists go, size-wise, yeah, selection-wise, to you, is that <laughs> small, medium, or large, that wine list? Uh, it's medium plus. I it, mean, for for... For a place that's serious about wine, it's. I, I mean, for most restaurants, I think this medium, is, medium plus. For I, most I think it's large most, for this place. For most restaurants, you know, for Thai and yeah. you know, how many tables do you have here? You know, so I think it's a big deal. Do you think it's harder to curate a smaller list like that, or if you're in some big fancy restaurant, you could just buy shit to put on the list? Yeah. You know, which I don't think you have the space, the time, probably have the money, but don't need to spend it on that. One thing that I don't know if people talk about enough is that like the 
art, there's an art to buying wine for a restaurant. There's a kind of a, a process a, and a relationships and politics and and there's um, and there's a kind of um, there's an art to it. And the the guys on the team they they kind of they know that you know there's things that we want. There's things that you got to wait for. Well, th- I want to ask you about that because some of the wines you talked about, like Burgundy and all of that, some of the um recently became or have been culty natural wines are virtually inaccessible. And if you can get them, the prices are crazy, whether it's in a restaurant or retail. Doesn't that drive you crazy a little? I mean, you haven't been doing, you know, I, I've talked to guys that have been doing this 20 years and 20 years ago, they were buying burgundy, you know, does that, drive you crazy or the good news is you found the producers that you like that are either younger, newer, maybe aligote instead of, you know, how do you morph to get to, you know, the good list? I mean, we've, we've hosted a lot of winemakers here. Um, you should. And there's like when I meet them, they're all such in real, such nice, lovely, generous people. Like Chanteray, those two are, uh, you, you wow. know, I mean, that's, if you can't fall in love with wine through them. I don't know what, and you're dead inside. Yeah, then the, <laughs> right, the category is, you know, move on to Legos. Or <laughs> right? Yeah, move on to like gin and tonics. Yeah. Um, which I love. But I, I, I think that it's crucial for the list to have multiple price points. I think our list is singing really well in between $100 and $150. That's I know the that sweet that's spot for really for good, really good quality, quality value. It's quality value that's like not hypey, hypey prices. Right. Can you get everything you want? Forget about the stuff you and I would love to get, the stuff that you need. Is it harder to get the stuff that you need or you're still cool? You could either replace it with something else or you get it. Uh, I mean, you they, probably they, have some sway they, now. They, you're they, going through they, wine, they, and you're the guy to some extent. Uh, Ian asks me all the time. He's like, the, "It's going to be this price. Like, what do you like? Should we buy? It's a lot." And I'm like, "Do you want it? And does it? And and does it mean something on the list?" And he's like, "Nah, we can wait." Or yes. And if like the answer is like it means something on the list for us and like it can do good for us. And That's we can, the criteria. Yeah. So you don't hit a wall like, oh, my God, nobody's buying wine over 200 bucks because it's over 200. If it's what you just said. Yeah. People say, well, I trust this on the list. Let me try it. Look, I mean, we got like a couple bottles of Salos and that's more than anyone can ever ask for but what, it's a but lot of money you're gonna get a guy who may want it it's nice to have it we may get one guy tonight <laughs> yeah it could be me <laughs> my kids won't appreciate it um all right so that's your identity here is as much a restaurant as it is a wine restaurant um, yeah um, i don't know if that was in your plans initially maybe that kind of gelled a little as you were going along i mean are you good with that you know you're not a wine bar you're not a restaurant you're a wine restaurant (laughs) it's a cool category i think it's great you know i don't think it's that easy um all right last thing is a personal thing we talked about your dad we talked about the pandemic we didn't talk about you a little um how much has your life changed emotionally, socially, you know, in the last three, four years? Are you still entrenched in this? Have you been able to, you know, do other stuff? Do you relish in some of the recognition that's well-deserved? I mean, I guess what I'm fishing for is this is great. You know, I'm at another level. Um, or you're telling me I'm in the kitchen like your dad. You know, where are you at with all of this? Right now, I mean, you can ask these guys. Uh, I'm not on the line. Last year I was. And this year I, I sort of told myself, like, in order for me to grow the business, we're going to have to, I'm going to have to hop off the line. And the guys. Always? Like that's, you're an offline guy or because, you're on to keep sharp two nights a week or not even that? 
Um, no, there's always there's always something to cut or peel. Okay. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I mean, I'm I'm I guess I'm more of a director here now, and that's sort of what I've always wanted because, like, I you know we I work with pre shifting the front and post shifting the front and right. like talking to the guys in the back and training some of the guys. But now I think the role is really to train managers because managers are the most important. They're the lifeblood of. So two things. That implies to me that frees you up in some way, you know, mentally and physically. True. Does yeah. that give you time to do things that you wanted to or even just to chill? Like, you want to know if I, like, go to Disneyland no, and stuff? No, <laughs> I just want to know if you can get to the things as trivial, trivial as they are that you can get to them. Yeah, you know, I, I love, I, life is kind of short and, like, I, um, I enjoy, I enjoy being here. I enjoy, you know, seeing how service is running. I enjoy seeing my mom Still. in the back, like cutting mangoes. Like, um, that's a nice thing. But it is, you know, I look, I look towards making this place like a really responsible, sus sustainably, you know, long lived business. And it means like there's a lot of things that have to be replaced and knobs that have to be changed and handles that need to be refurbished and. That's an the, ongoing it's, thing. It's ongoing because you're at, with a restaurant. You're you're constantly fighting decay, uh, uh, physical decay, mental decay, creative decay, right? And you're All hoping that. that you heal, you heal faster than you bleed out. Um, so I, I don't think we can uh, let our foot off the gas, you right? Know? Um, and now you're sort of situated in a different and what sounds like a better way to, you know, do all of that. Um, it's always about survival, but it's, I, it's a sad thing to say it that way, but that's sort of the way the restaurant business is, you know, it's, you know, I mean, I, I ran sales departments and sales and marketing and, you know, it was making, I, we didn't look at it as survival. You know, we looked at it as like making the budget or it was just a different mind, you know, but we didn't deal with perishables and personnel and, you know, low margins and all that crap. So, all right. Right. We're going to do two more things and then I'm going to let you go. We're going to do the wine list. We're going to ask you the five questions we've asked the 275 people that preceded you. Ooh. And then we're going to do the weekly wine sip. We're going to talk about this wine in a little detail because like I said, I wanted you to pull a bottle out that really reflects, you know, what's going on here. All right. So the wine list, five questions. Like I said, save five questions we've asked everybody. I'm curious, when you were listening to the podcast in the old days, did you ever listen to the wine list and say, oh, this guy said this is a good wine. I got to try it or whatever. Do you remember any of that? I'm sure there were. I have to... I. All right, let's, let's see what you back. said. All right. Okay, let's hear it. Let's so hear. here's the first question. What are you drinking now? What's in your fridge at home? What are you trying? There's not much seasons here, so you're not changing seasonality. Is there stuff you're tasting new for the restaurant? What's the now answer? The not what you drink on a regular. What's going on now? Wine-wise or not wine-wise? Wine, just wine. Or, you know, if, if you said... I'm sick of wine. I'm drinking beer. Whatever you know. Um, uh, for for me, uh, Do you have a mini obsession right now, or you know, I I I I I I have to say, there's just some unique things on the list that I I like really love and that always like really surprise me. Let's hear um, that. I want to hear specifics. <laughs> I love the Matthias and peach wine that we have. Matha Steve Matthias <laughs> makes a peach wine. Peach, yeah. a fruit wine. It's it's pretty bomb. When do you drink it? Is that a pre and aperitif during a meal or? In terms of a wine goes, it's good whenever. It's, okay. It's, it's, How much of is he making? Is he making like? I don't know. Not a lot. I mean, we God, have. I've never heard anyone say Matthias and peach. I'll show, I'll show it to you. It's cool. Um, 
It's Is it super peach tasty. Because you have a predisposition for peach. Yeah. <laughs> no, he's. I mean, he's. He's been making this for a couple of years, um, and it's Chardonnay from his Linda Vista Vineyard right. with um, with peaches, and the peach comes through a little bit, and it's not sweet. It's dry. It's just so. Fun. It's like a. It's a co-ferment with fruit, which yeah. is. I, you know, more people are making it, more people are talking about it. I totally trust him to do it. So, yeah, of course. you know, now you got my interest peaked. And that's the whole point of this, because people are going to say, I didn't know that. All right, give me something else you're drinking now. Um, we have this, uh, you know what? Um, M- Madeira. Recently? Yeah. Or okay, so, so Madeira been, is a so thing we've now. Been kind of going. Oh, well, it's been a thing for a good but a good amount of time. Trust me, I cover this <laughs> stuff for years. You're reading more about it. There's more I, Madeira tastings. There's more writing about we're, it. We we put it it's into been the, there and it's been good. Is your point? We but. put it into the the omakase. Um, uh, oh, so I pronounced reserve. omakase wrong? Uh, I don't. I you know. I mean, my girlfriend's half Japanese. She's like, you have to say it this way, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> That's so, funny. Uh, All right. But we have the, the, we have the, you know, it's like an 89 Cercial and it's tasty and it's so bright and acidic, but it's so like, it's so complex and it's sweet, but it's not sweet. And it goes so well with the like mango sticky rice that like, I'm, I think it brings mango sticky rice to a new height. Right. You found the perfect pairing. Yeah. What, um. I don't know the answer. This is why I'm asking. Is is it reasonably priced? Is because you know it's got some aging on it and it's not that available. It's expensive. I mean, where do you where does pricing on Madeira fit? It's. I mean, at least this stuff. It's still kind of expensive. Huh? It is okay. But I. But I, it's a treat type thing. You know, it's. Yeah, I mean, it's a very small pour, and you don't need a lot right. of it to appreciate it. Um, I think it's cool. I think, uh, yeah, not a lot of people like oxidation and sweetness right. in wine right. or fruit and wine. But I'm like, guys, just but Madeira, everyone calm down. Madeira scream, screams oxidation. So Especially if you don't like, like it. Yeah, if you don't like oxidation. If you don't like, you know, uh, you know, old oxidized wine. Yeah. Then it's not going to be your thing. All right. Second question, the goofiest question. And we talked a little about this. Your favorite wine and food pairing. Not what you think is a good one. And certainly something you don't eat all the time. But what's, what's a wine that goes great with a food that works? And we have a Grape Nation rule. You can't say champagne and oysters. <laughs> you can't say champagne and fried chicken. No, yeah. Or pizza. I, those yeah. are good ones. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's true. No, those are great. Um, let's see. I had... A dessert recently. We're, we're on the we're on the realm of um, dessert right now in my mind. And my friend gave me okay. This is a slightly bougie answer. Okay. Uh, Good disclaimer. <laughs> so my my friend gave me a very old bottle of Hewitt. Um, Blueberry. Nineteen. 19- 48. Oh, wow. Jesus. And if you've ever had the chance to to land on old, really properly stored um, Riesling, I mean, sorry, Shenan, Shenan yeah. um, from Vouvray, um, this was like impeccable. It was like... This is um, the dry, not the sweet? Oh, it was the, the sweet. The it sweet one, sweet. yeah. And it just kind of... We were having them with these uh, these little Hanukkah cookies... Um, macaroons? Th- no, no they were, that's they're Passover. Like a, they're like a, they're, they were a butter. We found them at this market, and it was like, uh, like a kind of a butter cookie, and it was the not most, too sweet, but a little richness and sweetness. And 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 we had them with uh, some donuts from somewhere, sidecar. It was some really nice, like like blueberry donuts, and like tough to get donuts in L.A. Yeah, well, and 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 it was so kind of like it was the most it was the highest low combo that I've ever seen, uh, and it just worked, and it was it was so enjoyable. That's how you answer the question because that <laughs> was memorable, and I'm sure you've had many other pairings and all that. 
All right. This question, and you're the type of guy that works your ass off, but I don't think you like to stay around. You know, you like to get out. Um, I think you can answer this. And by answering it, you're not leaving anyone out or off. We're not ranking this. But tell me favorite wine restaurant and or bar. Like, I'm going to say this place. If you want to walk in, and we talked about, is this a wine place? Is this a restaurant? This is a great... If you walk into a place, the selection, the knowledge, the vibe, the people, the food, who does that for you around here? Do you not want to answer or you can't? (laughs) I don't want you to feel like if I mention this guy and I don't, you know, he'll come up to me. No, there's so many great places. Um, I'll tell you one thing. What? It's hard for me to drink wine outside of here. Why? Because you don't it's trust. <laughs> it's, a, it's a terrible answer. No, I want to hear it now. Well, no, I, I, feel, I feel like there, there, there are some amazing, amazing psalms around. Um, I actually, but it is, it is, I just, I guess like now I'm like, I like what I like. And, um, but where do I find still like some curiosity? I still have curiosity when I go. Right. Um, I think Antico has a very distilled list and it's somewhere where the wine tastes good with every single dish. That's that's a big deal. When I go, I still find stuff that I can really geek out on, but I'll never get the stuff that I geek out on. You always get the adjacent stuff that's like, "Whoa, what the hell is that?" Why? Why because I want to know. I mean, we right. because we've tasted that thing okay, or that, that whatever. Makes sense. And um Rachel over there, just wine director, she's just done a fantastic where is that? job. It's in uh, K Town, okay, and it's a very, very, very good Italian spot by my friend Chad Colby, and um, and Rachel does a good job, and the with and the, the wine, wine room is beautiful, and like I don't know, it just wine tastes better in that environment. For my own personal selfishness, that would be one of the better Italian food experiences in LA to go to. I mean, yes. hands down, okay. Um, all right, we'll take that one. Fourth question, favorite all-time wine. The original question six, seven years ago was talking to guests and asking them, what's the rarest, most expensive wine you ever had? Like Aldo Sam from Le Bernardin. You know, I don't care about that anymore. I asked him the same question because he's been on twice. What's the wine to you that was transformative, that was a gateway, that's memorable, mm. that's important? And that doesn't mean expensive or rare. That means, you know, this is the wine that introduced me to the Loire, whatever. Do you have a wine or two that comes to mind? I remember reading Eric Asimov's book. Um, and he's like talking about J.J. Prume. Okay. And I believe it was early on in the book he talks about J.J. Prume. He says something along the lines of like, if you haven't had JJ Proom, you should have it. And I, I immediately went online and, and I you were dialed into him. So I was like, that was credible. Was like, like it was he's cre- saying it. If he's saying JJ, <laughs> right. this JJ character, I was like, let's let's go for it. I opened it up. I was like, what? Like, what the really? hell is going on? You That's know, a good story. Um, when was that? Must have been oh. Eight oh seven. You were drinking it. No, 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 no. It must have been. Yeah, drinking it must have been two thousand ten. Right, two thousand ten. Oh seven or eight, a year or two later. Is that what you're saying? No, I I cracked that baby open right, right away. away. Yeah, just, come on. Well, hey, no, no, you no. Talking it's, about it, you're gonna look at it. Well, yeah. I mean, you're other, so intrigued. And I tell I tell Abe this all the time, but one of Abe's Abe Shoners early wine from Scolium Project, he had done one that had like a trillion different white grapes in it that were all from different years. And I think he does one similar now. With LA back, Wine Company? Yeah. Cucamonga Field Blend or something? Yeah, some crazy <laughs> stuff. But like back then it was all Napa fruit and it was called something super obscure as how he does. And I tell him all the time, I'm like, Abe, hey, like, 
And he's a very humble guy. But I was like, you know, that's one of like the epiphany wines for me outside of the JJ Proof answer because I was I was tasting things that I had never tasted before in wine. And that's someone who like appreciates really traditionally made wine and also goes above and beyond to kind of like find the like what the where we are on the contemporary edge of wine. I agree. Um Scott Sampler from Scotty Boy Wine does the same for me with his reds. His reds are especially the ones that he like he's been fermenting for like two years are some of the most insane. If you get a vintage um Scott Sampler wine, they are so complex um and they are they are the they're at the cutting edge right now it's, you're the second person this week that brought him up and like months previous nobody you know which oh, is he's, he's awesome it's nice to hear um those are good ones and i didn't mention this i post the answers on social media what fun is it you know people listen yeah hell yeah answers but we put out all right last question this is the question, but we'll modify it a little. I want you to recommend to me the best wine around 15, 20, 22 bucks. I want a red and a white retail. You could go category. Like you could say Muscadet. You'll, you'll find a good maker at 20 bucks. What, what do you think? But then the modification to the question is you could tell me the best quality to value wines that don't go too far off the chart. Pick me a red, pick me a white. In that price range, you could probably walk into a nice wine store and find a really good white and red from the Loire Valley. Um, so go with I the Loire. Well, at 100%, the value is there. Um, I would say even in, in Beaujolais, look, like... Yeah, but that's you know, creeping now up it's too. Cre- it's creeping. Look, I mean, this is now 155 on a list, but um, I I do still love a really fresh Muscadet. You know, Pepier is fantastic, solid, and you uh, can get in that. Literally thing. any Chocolina, but Rosé Chocolina specifically is so bomb. All right, so Chocolina, Chocolina Rosé. I so see that. That's you know, it's all starting to buzz in your head. Those are like great recommendations. Um, it's and- a it's a fuzzy, delicious, spritzy, natural thing. Thing. Sometimes the spritz surprises people. They're like, "What is the spritz?" But that's we deal with that. All right. Good answers. Like I said, I, I'm oh going to post them. Um, <laughs> the final thing is our weekly wine sip. Every week we try to taste a different wine on air. You know, I have a lot of winemakers. I have a lot of psalms. What's better than sitting with a winemaker and saying, let's talk about a wine that you picked, a psalm that highlights it with you. Um, wine is so important to this place. So that's, there's a Yiddish term, schnur. I didn't try to schnur a wine off of you. I wanted you to pick a wine that you feel really, you know, represents, you know, what we're doing here wine-wise. And tell me what you selected. You selected a Kermit Lynch selection, one of the, was Foyard one of the Gang of Four? Gang of Four? four, A Foyard Flore, which is one of the 10 crews in... All right, so tell me about this wine. Well, let's first pour you a little bit more. Um, we have an evaluation process, which we're going to go through, too. But tell me about see. this wine and why you picked this. And when I walked in here, you knew that we wanted to taste the wine, and you were looking for something. You had to call your wine guy and say, this is the I wine I want to, to taste. Just, Where the hell is it? it was, I just wanted to confirm why? that we we wanted to go with the decision we wanted to go with because... There's a lot of wines that you could say really represent this place from the Scotty Boy and a Jack wine, which is the most natural wine that we probably have on the list. When you say Scotty Boy and a Jack, is he making it for you? uh, It's it's a it's a it's it's a collaboration or something. Collaboration. Okay. To like, you know, uh, Lopez de Heredia, you know, which 10, 12, 15 years. It feels equally us. Um, We pick something that. that that's the answer earlier to contemporary and traditional. Yeah. I would say Lopez Heredia is as traditional 
But which, but what's, but, but there's, there's something nat- very but cool about, right, but right, they're right. also naturally made. Right. So it's Romani Conti, you know. Yeah. Um, all right. So this is, why did we pick this one? Well, um, in terms of the traditional aspect, the classical aspect, I mean, uh, Gang of Four, um, one of the things that we look at is power power without weight and gamay gives me that there's uh, there's such a lightness on the tongue there's no the body is seemingly invisible it's you know it's silk chiffon but uh, ian says this all the time he he's like it's it's an iron fist with a velvet glove right and um and i think it is kind of velvet do you feel I think that's a great description. Do you feel that's more with Flore than Morgone, which may have a little more body, or yeah. Bojo in general? Like this oh, to- checks the specific boxes you talked about, right? I would say the small variations are are, are notable for some. Some people like a little bit of grip and right. broadness, but I... I want to sit with a wine for a while. I want to drink a bottle, and I want to get another bottle. So I want to maybe move on. Move on to Black Beer's more going out. So let's do a quick evaluation on yes. the col- on the color for uh, a Flore. It's it's you know it's a nice rich purple. It's not deep dark brooding, but you know the and, color's pretty deep, right? And it's like pink around the edge, yeah, which is key. Yeah, it's really nice in that sense. All right, yeah. I suck at this. But, I mean, I know what I'm smelling. I just have a problem describing it. What do you get on the nose with this wine? Stick your schnoz in there and tell me what you get. The schnoz is in. I think there's such a, um, one of the things about, you know, Beaujolais in general is it's it's a balance between fruit and minerality, right? So, this is very much on the fruit forward side. You almost which fruits, think it's though? which fruit? I Red fruits. It's, like, it's definitely it's a, not black fruit. It's like it's cranberry vibe. Yeah, but but it's subtle. It's not cranberry yeah. jump in your face. It's not raspberries. It's a red fruit line that's subtle. Um, I agree with that. And yes, there's that great minerality. Now, mouthfeel. You know, Gamay has can run the range. This is like a medium. Right? Yeah, medium minus. Um, yeah, medium minus. There's a little right. bit of. There's a little bit of. Uh, there's a little bit of tannin in there, and the structure is like, it's so strong in this wine. I think structure may be the answer to your like, what's the criteria for selecting wines here? And it's like structure is so you know subjective. I but. think structure is important. Oh my um, god, this is so good. It is really. This good. is so All good. All right, so let's. Let's let's throw it over the tongue now. Throw it over the tongue. And right. let's see if the palate replicates the nose or if there's anything else in there that we admire. Well, one of the things is you- we're two jamokes sitting on a Sunday in a closed restaurant drinking wine. Drinking wine where the blender is going at full blast. <laughs> now right? it is. I'm so sorry. Hey, guys. what's that noise in the background? All right. So um, um palette one of the things i didn't mention is that there is a blast of reductiveness at the beginning which i feel is really like a, a marker of that kind of mild but interesting but there yeah it's yeah and it, it's going it's going away there is there's a little bit of the nose has even changed when mm-hmm. when you cork the bottle and then took it off and poured it it took Five minutes for that nose to blow to come, off. Yeah, to come. Yeah. You know, now it's Should've. kind of pure. No, no, no. That's interesting to do it. Um, it's actually, there's like a hint of savory. There's. Very savory. There's a hint of savory. Maybe I'm not eating with anything, but like I love this kind of like bright fruit with. with it's not that. overly bright though. It's good bright. It's good bright. Yeah, it's not. I <laughs> it's mean, good you bright. and I could rip open bright wines that show yeah. well as bright. This is all well integrated as far as the descriptors. Not too bright, savory, it's like minerality. A, there's a baby amount of like tobacco, like a baby amount of cocoa nib. And 
there's slightly something kind of green in the background. I don't get that, but I, I think if I stay with it, because I like that element. To me, it's interesting, like green, if it's done well. It's it's pine-like in a certain way. Um, I think it goes great, by the way, with let's, curry. Let's, let's go pairings. Ooh. Curry? Curry. Curry. So straight up curry. Um, you have a bunch of curry dishes, right? A few. Okay. A few. Um, if you get out of the curry realm, anything else you think it would go Honestly, well? grilled fish, grilled cabbage. You have that here. Yeah, 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 yeah. You'll Why try. does it work? Because cabbage... Cabbage is reductive. Right. That's one small thing. The grilling gives it a little char a with little the reduction. Char, a little sweetness. This kind of covers it nicely. Our cabbage is kind of like, it's got notes of like French toast because we base it with a little coconut milk. So it's got a little bit of Ooh. like, and so. Oh, well, My we'll, wife lo- lo- loves cabbage. So we'll, we'll, be, we'll, we'll get you. I'll get you a little All right, cabbage so too. So we got to wrap up. We've been here an hour and a half. You're wasting my time <laughs> now. There was a time where this was fun and interesting for me. Now you're wasting my oh, time. Oh, jeez. No, no, no. Are you kidding me? I could sit there another hour, but you can't. All right. So we don't like this wine. We love this wine. I mean, this is this 100%. represents everything we love about drinking wine. I agree with you. Yeah. You know, I mean, um, 21, Floyard, Flory, just the straight up Flory. Um, and it's it's naturally made. Is biodynamic. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, if you it's know, native yeast, but it's super elegant when you drink it. It's it is an elegant wine. It, I, mean, it is. It, this I, is I love a, this Gamay is. for that. All those elements. Yeah, I just think you know, it's just I have more Beaujolais and Gamay than I've ever had, and I've been buying it and now. I'm like ripping open like fifteen, cool. eleven. Yeah, it's like when I bought them, like I'll drink these in a year. You know, now it's really cool. All right, Justin, we have to wrap up. Darn. Darn is right. Um, Just so everyone knows, we'll be back here for dinner tonight. Um, We will eat anything but eel and lamb. Gotcha. Okay. We will drink anything. The funkier, the better. Price is a consideration, but not the only consideration. <laughs> um, Fair. And the more we taste, the happier we will be. So, um, and I will uh, put some notations in about the food and everything. All right. So let me do a quick wrap up and I want to get some info from you because I'm sure people have been intrigued. So if you have a question, suggestion, wine happening or event, hit me up at sam at the grape that's Sam at thegrapenation.com. Subscribe to the Grape Nation podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Podcasts, wherever you get your pods. If you like this, leave a review, positive review. Follow us on Instagram at sbenruby and on x at benruby. I know they're different, but you can always reach us with the hashtag the Grape Nation to find us on both. We are on Facebook at The Grape Nation. As I mentioned, we will post Justin's wine list answers, some interesting stuff there. And we will give you information about today's weekly wine sip, the Foyard Flory 2021. Um, so, Justin, if people, not if, the people that are intrigued, if they want to, like they're coming into L.A. or they didn't know about it, where do they go to get more info on Anna Jack? Is the website the place? Or? The website's good, AnnaJackTie.com, A-N-A-J-A-K-T-H-A-I.com. Um, Fair warning, because of everything I said in the intro, Restaurant of the Year, James Beard Award, mm-hmm. not the easiest place to get into, but hardly impossible Part of it is it is not a big restaurant, so we're not talking about, you know, a zillion tables. So do your planning. Um, Fair to say that? Fair to say that. Um, And now if we want to find or follow on social media, I think Instagram's your wheelhouse. We could follow you in the restaurant where? Uh, Anna Jack Thai Food. Add food at the end. At Anna Jack Thai Food. A-N-A-J-A-K. Thai, if you don't know how to spell Thai by now. T H I G H. T H A I. Okay. <laughs> Food. All right. Um, and then, Justin, you have your own um, site. 
your own, own Instagram, Instagram account. Yeah. That is? It's Justin Peach Peach. Okay. And Peach is Peachette? Peach is Peach, P-E-A-C-H. As, as in, in peach at long as, as in peach wine. Right. <laughs> Matthias and peach wine. All right. Thank you to our guest, Justin Peach at Rungzi, Peach Peach. Thank you to our engineer, Armin, and everyone at the Heritage Radio Network. I'm Sam Ben Ruby, and you have been listening to The Grape Nation. The Grape Nation is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network. Food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe.